Thanks everybody for sharing your lunch um, with me today. And uh, when I had put together a PowerPoint, and it really started with the zoo's involvement in conservation, and where we, when we were looking for a local project. And as you all know, we ended up uh, partnering with the DNR about the Greater Prairie Chicken. And so I have an update of the Greater Prairie Chicken project for us. But that sort of led me to Iowa's other wildlife and their stories. And, and by uncovering that, I found a lot of things that are interesting to me. And so I thought they might be interesting to you all, especially those of us who currently live in Iowa or have a long history in Iowa. I think it's um, good to be aware of the conservation issues in your own backyard. And uh, so that's uh, what I'm going to try to do today. As far as the greater prairie chicken, um, I want to go over a little bit over in the state. You can kind of see from the map there on the left that the light green is the former range of the prairie chicken, and where it is currently left is the dark green. And there is kind of a neat, uh, an interesting story that goes along with that. There are still three states that allow hunting of the prairie chicken. They feel like they have a stable enough population that they can do that. And that's kind of why we, um, the DNR reached an agreement with the state of Nebraska that they still hunt birds and so they have surplus birds. But there are real specific um, criteria in order for us to move birds. They aren't just captured anywhere. Um, the social behavior of prairie chickens and what you're seeing here, especially down on the left, you get males on a lek, a place where they come and they display and the females fly in. So the Nebraska Fish and Game identified where those leks were. Um, they have them mapped out and they had a requirement and it was something like uh, you could only take um, 10% of the birds using that lek. You couldn't just go and take all the birds that come there because they didn't want to disrupt um, the patterns that they had. Um, and they had a different requirement for males and for females. And kind of the, the history of the greater prairie chicken in Iowa is that it is actually tied to um, the grasslands, the prairie, as much as the bison. And um, the, and I think what the interesting part for me is that during initial European settlement of the state, prairie chicken population bloomed. And there was a term then that the prairie chickens followed the plow because as settlers turned the prairie and moved up north, the, the prairie chicken population went with them. And I remember uh, Dan McCabe was the, he's the board steering committee member for the Conservation Alliance, and he said, great, finally something that uh, somebody could say John Deere is helping wildlife. Because at that time, they were helping increase uh, the greater prairie chicken population. Something else, prairie chickens in Iowa, um, when people started to get concerned that the population wasn't going to be able to sustain the commercial hunting. It was the first time ever in the United States that a bag limit was used on any species of animal. And it was in Iowa. And the bag limit was 25 per day of greater prairie chickens. And now this is at a time where you could hunt them year round, but the most time they were vulnerable is during the breeding season, March and April, when the males would come and collect uh, on the leks. So uh, from a timeline standpoint, um, by 1878 is when that bag limit was established, but by 1915 um, th they stopped hunting and trapping. And another thing that uh, what I read about the, the um, pioneers on the prairie, what farmers would do, they have their crops in the summer and basically they would capture prairie chickens over the winter. Because just like poultry, you could um, capture them supposedly relatively easy by setting traps. Uh, use corn for bait and, and you uh, basically they just eviscerate the birds and soak them in salt water and put them on the train to Chicago. And uh, it was actually uh, a source of income for many Iowa farmers and that would help them through the winter with the source of income. Um, anyways, for um, Iowa, you can see there 1954 uh, is when the last uh, bird was seen and Appanoose County is down in southern Iowa, not too far from here. Um, Prior to our partnership with the DNR, there was an attempt in the 1980s to uh, release birds back into Iowa. And so you can see 561 birds were moved, and they were released at the Kellerton area, and they were also released um, over in the Les Hills, which um, is the area towards Omaha along the river. However, um, 
the birds did not become self-sustaining. And when we talked to the DNR in 2011, they thought there was maybe 30 birds left in Kellerton. And, and so at this time, they're you know, getting worried that uh, if there'd be genetically inbred, it's an isolated population, and there wouldn't be any um, new genes coming through the group. So when we partnered with them, this was our plan. We were going to, we, we funded a seasonal technician to do a habitat survey because if um, the, the Iowa DNR, which gets most of its funding from hunting and fishing licenses and uh, firearms taxes, um, the greater prairie chicken kind of falls into the non-game category and they have a very small budget and um, Stephanie Shepard, the non-game biologist, thought that we needed some data to do a couple of things. One, to prove that if we, uh, that it would be helpful, that the habitat was there to support a, a population of prairie chickens. So that was the first thing that we did, collect a lot of data points, and she used that data to show that, um, that there was a suitable habitat to support prairie chickens, and she used that to convince the head of the Iowa DNR that um, he, because he was the one who was going to have to uh, get permission from a state to move birds to Iowa. So down in Ringold County, and I don't know if you can see that, but Little Mount Air is down there. That area that's all lit up there is called the, um, the Grand River Grasslands. There's actually the Grand River runs through there. And the different colors on there, you pr probably kind of hard to see, but the bluer it is, the more suitable habitat it is um, for greater prairie chickens. So looking at that, 70,000 acres, and when you get across the Missouri border, the Nature Conservancy has the Dunn Ranch, which was a cattle ranch that was given to the Nature Conservancy, and they now manage it uh, for prairie restoration, and they had a few birds left too. So at this point, the Missouri um, conservation folks are interested in also receiving birds and looking at it as one, as one um, area. So we moved the first birds in 2012. There was 48 birds um, last year uh, where some of our staff were involved and we're trying, our idea is that we build some capacity among staff to actually be more of an assistance to the process. I think what we learned uh, is a couple of things. One is that it's a long ways to drive. It's about eight or nine hours to western Nebraska. And so if you can't really stay for more than three days, why, you know, you spend more time in the car. But it was really to expose us to the process. I think uh, Megan Van Gundy pointed out to them that you can actually do something medically for the birds. The idea for the DNR is you capture the birds, you release them as soon as you can. That's how you get the highest survival rate. But how they are trapped is with chicken wire, and chicken wire and wild birds don't always get along well, and so there's a lot of scrapes and kinds of things, um, some simple things that maybe could be done to increase their survivability. And they are kind of finding that the birds that are a little bit underweight when they come are the ones that are, are not as successful once they get translocated. They did put on 10 females that were released in Iowa, and this is where the zoo's uh, $10,000 went this year, was to purchase GPS units that were attached onto the 10 females. Because uh, the first year, at the funding level, all they could do was ban birds, so that if birds were found, they might collect some data. This year, we went to um, GPS, and the thing is, each GPS unit costs over $2,000. So you don't get a whole lot, but you get a whole lot of information without much manpower. Missouri went the other route, where they went with radio transmitters, which they attach to every bird released in Missouri. But you have to have a technician in the field with the, um, the, uh, to pick up the signal. And you kind of get an idea. And the problem is that if you're not anywhere in the range of the bird, you kind of lose them a whole lot easier than you do with the GPS. Um, this was an idea of what western Nebraska looked like, where the prairie chickens came from. Um, all the birds from both times was from private land uh, out of 10,000 acre cattle ranch out there. It's pretty dry. In my mind, it seems like you get to Iowa and there's all these vegetative resources and it really should be, um, it should, prairie chickens should be able to do well. Um, the thing on the left is all the GPS coordinates for those 10 females. Actually, each one of the 10 has a different color. And uh, what they were trying to do was get an idea of dispersal and what really happens to the success of these birds after they're moved. Now, bear in mind, it's only 10 out of the 78 moved um, and actually all perished by the fall. And, but one uh, extraordinary event 
is the picture on the right. Um, that tracking is all one bird, and it was the bird that, as far as I know, still uh, may still survive. Um, but she traveled over 1,500 miles in a big circle around the release site, coming up as far as Warren County and uh, as far down into Missouri as over 100 miles. Um, so really, if she'd had a map, she'd have been back to Nebraska <laughs> without any trouble. Um, but it is interesting on that behavior that through that circumpolar travel, she ends it up basically back near the release site, back in the grasslands area that we are hoping that uh, they become established. Um, so the challenges for the greater prairie chicken, um, and, and I should say, I, I keep talking about the prairie chicken because that's what we're focused on. The way the DNR sees it is that just like the trumpeter swan was a flagship species for wetlands, their idea of introducing the trumpeter swan wasn't so much just about the swan, it was about raising the level of awareness of the importance of wetlands. The prairie chicken, even if it never ends up having a sustainable population in Iowa, it is a symbol of grassland species birds and it represents a whole community of species that need grasslands to survive. So they figure if people are interested in the prairie chicken um, and they have habitat and they manage grazing lands that support prairie chickens, it'll support about 20 other species that re really rely on a, a grassland habitat. But in that 70,000 acres, um, grazing and prairie chickens get along just fine, um, but of course overgrazing doesn't, um, d doesn't help. Um, and more and more with the price of corn, people are converting grass and pastures into crops as much as they can. And so there is that possibility, even though in southern Iowa it is a lot of rolling hills and it has been cattle grazing for a long time. Um, and of course, like all species, when you talk about, no matter if it's uh, gold line tamarins or whatever, fragmentation of habitat and uh, the inability to um, travel and, and genetically mix is a problem. Um, and the conversion to non-native grasses, um, kind of the, the stickler there is that, um, you know, if you're talking about hay production, you can have, co you know, cold se cool season grasses and, and they sort of, they're really green in the spring and then by summer they dry up. Native grasses tend to be um, more green and, uh, you know, provide more nutrients to birds later in the summer. So there's sort of this, uh, if you go to too much cool season, you're sort of, pulling a food source away from the birds. And probably the biggest thing that really lets you know the prairie chicken is part of the prairie system is that the fire suppression uh, that allows for woody plants to encroach even on farmers' pastures um, is a detriment to prairie chickens. And they think that part of that is that when the prairie chickens are out on the lek, they really do expose themselves to aerial predators. And what trees growing up in fence lines and, and allow is give birds of prey places to sit and really predate these prairie chickens that are just following their normal social behavior. So our future plans, 2014, we are going to um, go back, get some more birds. And we actually have permission from Nebraska for 14 and 15 to move bird, about 100 birds each year. Um, but, uh, and one of the things uh, about the dispersal of the birds and that big long thing, they're gonna do some, there's a graduate student at Iowa State that is working on this project and they're gonna try a callback system to try and, um, you know, keep the released birds in the area where they've been released. Um, there's been other thoughts, you know, we kind of, when they're captured, they're captured during the breeding time because they're easiest to catch. Uh, may not be the most ideal time to move a bird. Um, however, birds that were moved uh, in Missouri, uh, there was at least three known nestings and hatchings of birds. So even though they get plucked uh, you know, out of the breeding season, some of them actually were able to reproduce and uh, young prairie chickens were seen on the Nature Conservancy plan. So, I guess, so that little update on prairie chickens, I'll just kind of keep moving faster. So then I'm thinking, all right, so maybe it's the prairie chicken's turn to be restored to Iowa. And so as I was kind of looking back at um, uh, the, the history of, wi of wildlife in Iowa, mainly because I'm interested because um, I've grown up in Iowa, I'm familiar with it, and all the changes that have occurred in Iowa, they're not that long ago. 
And so if you have grandparents that lived in Iowa or maybe their parents who lived in Iowa, that's the where there's been this dramatic change in Iowa in the last 150 years. And uh, maybe 150 years seems long, but when you start uh, thinking about that maybe your grandparents were alive and there's been these dramatic changes, it's not so much. Um, I've often heard now, like people come through Iowa, oh yeah, it, if you're positive, you'll say it looks like a garden because you have all these fields that are in rows and all that stuff. But um, if you don't, if, if you don't look at it in a positive way, you look at it as a totally changed environment. And uh, I got a couple slides that are interesting to me in that uh, Iowa is supposed to, the, the, uh, the habitat is 98% uh, changed from where it was pre-settlement. And so that's what the native wildlife um, have had to uh, sort of endure. Um, kind of on the left there, I just like that picture of the kid riding a pig. It really has, it just kind of symbolizes a change of that. That, um, so my dad raised on a farm, uh, born in 1932. That um, is about what the farms would have been like prior to the 1950s. Very uh, much uh, smaller operations and um, you know, just a different set of circumstances. Not nearly as impactful um, on the environment as uh, modern agriculture. Um, you know, you can see that you know, it was this, this, it's really the soil that um, brought about these dramatic changes. And so pre-settlement, this is, I'll, I'll just point out some of the things. Basically what's about in Iowa, as, you, as we talk about the other species of wildlife that I'm going to, you can sort of think of uh, the eastern part of Iowa as more forested, and that would be the dark green. Basically follows rivers and river bottoms. Um, all the light green would be grassland. And it would be another conversation about the glaciation and how we ended up with this, but you can see down the center part of the state, the blue there, those are all wetlands. Prior to the, um, the draining of wetlands, um, that is kind of what Iowa was, and actually this is actually not so much pre-settlement, but it is the best map I could find that kind of showed that. But when we talk about forests in the east and um, wetlands in the center and grasslands in the west, that's kind of what Iowa is. And this is what it is today. Um, all the brown is row crop. Um, so when we talk about, oh, it's 98% change from where it was, that's why. There's um, the remaining grasslands, which was most, is still the green. And um, you can kind of see the purple, the metropolitan areas too. But I think um, sometimes, uh, when, uh, you know, you got to see it in the whole big picture. And it's like, is Iowa really that different? Well, on that scale there, you can see the state that's most changed from its natural um, vegetation is Iowa. And uh, even other agricultural states like Illinois and uh, Indiana, our neighbors, still Iowa is number one. Um, so as we start thinking about Iowa's natural heritage and, and what animals would have been here, you cannot talk about the bison. Um, the map on the right there shows the pre-settlement distribution of bison. Um, there really were looked at as two different species, the plains, which is dark brown, and the woodland bison, which is um, the lighter tan color. And then the real light tan, which you can see there is actually um, another species of bison that went extinct you know, prior to uh, settlement. Um, but I think it's interesting when we talk, they, they thought at pre-settlement that there was over 70 million bison in North America. They really uh, were an intricate part of the grassland, the prairie systems. And like today, we talk about uh, a million wildebeest uh, migration in Africa. I mean, it had to really compare, you know, it had to not even really compare to um, the bison herds that would have, um, you know, been uh, in the state even. Um, but kind of the, the how that went for bison, um, in the early 1800s, you know, the, the, the country is looked at a, a land of boundless resources. Um, Iowa doesn't become a state until the mid-1800s, so even before that. Um, and, you know, it was the pioneering attitude that um, you conquer and you um, 
exploit the riches, and, by, and, and wildlife was a resource that was exploited. And uh, there, you can find different pictures, but um, that is a pile of skulls at the bottom. And basically, basically it was the hides. People were after the commercial hunting part, and so really the carcass was always left. And, uh, but bones have a use too. Once they're there, it can be ground up and used for things. Um, however, by 1890, there was um, only about 1,000 bison left. And, um, and uh, the last one killed in Polk County was uh, 1850. So uh, about the time that I was becoming a state is when the bison were just about to their end uh, in Iowa. And uh, I, I have a little interesting story about that. So my, uh, my uh, grandparents uh, came to Iowa right after statehood, about, um, about 1850. And uh, I was told, whether it's true or not, and, and maybe those of you who have know more about dairy, you know, fam they came on the prairie schooner and all that kind of stuff from Germany. And you have a milk cow, and the cow is important to the family. That's your resource. And, but a cow has to freshen, uh, she has to give birth every once in a while as, so that she can continue to give milk. Um, you know, you can, she, you can wean the calf off and then if you keep hand milking the cow, she keeps giving milk for another while, but eventually um, she stops. And so uh, when people came, they just have a cow and they don't bring a bull along. And so at, in 1850 in Carroll County, they could release the cow and she would get bred by a bison bull and she'd come back, and then that's how you could freshen your cow. And um, that was still at a time where, if anybody is familiar with Carroll County, I know some of our educators go to Carroll and go to Swan Lake State Park, and where that state park was is really where um, the last bison were in the county and also the last Native Americans uh, in Carroll County. Um, and, we did, and the bison, if you call it recovery if you want, the bison situation had a connection to zoos at the time that uh, the Bronx Zoo actually um, had bison in captivity and they sent some back and they really think that for the bison that are existing today that they, that, that um, really was um, helped by that, that um, influx of, of uh, animals from the Bronx Zoo. And today it's about 40,000 that exist today. However, very few are free ranging. And the, the American Bison Society actually went away for a while and now it's actually come back again. And then now their goal is to work on free ranging bison herds and how they can support that. And so they're looking at grassland area, you know, big patches in Kansas and the Dakotas and how there could actually be free range herds of bison. And e even in Iowa, up in northwest Iowa, the Nature Conservancy has kind of experimented a little bit with, with bison in larger areas too. Um, but. Um, but there were other large, large mammals other than bison. And we're, I'm going to kind of just say a little story about each one. But um, you can imagine, as uh, after statehood and after those things, um, these species also um, began to disappear from Iowa's landscape. And the, my thing there about the predators, anyway, you know, there's a bounty on predators, and as a pioneer, you were thinking, you were, you know, concerned about self-supporting and, and your livestock and and and. Predators were considered a competitor for people, and so even if you were into hunting, you didn't want to share uh, your game with the predators. And uh, one of the, I just think it's interesting, after 1846, the, one of the first laws passed had to do with um, bounties on predators. And it was all predators, um, and, you know, birds of prey as well. Um, so on the east, as the forests were cut and diminished, um, these species declined um, with that. They're not so much grassland species. Um, the waterfowl numbers, you saw a whole big center part of the state was all um, waterfowl nesting and all that. And so there's commercial hunting of, um, of geese too. Um, so by the early 1900s, um, giant Canada geese, sandhill cranes, trumpeter swans, otters, they're all considered um, extirpated from the state. Now there's a few things that, uh, you know, 
started to have a turnaround. And so I guess I'm getting down to this point. And now we're going to start talking about where species are at as we get closer to uh, modern day. Um, so they tried to, to stop the illegal move of game, tried to affect the commercial hunting. The Migratory Bird Act, which still there's some effects today for like the zoo, and we want to move migratory waterfowl around. I guess we don't have that many but the swans. Why, there's still a permit process with the federal government to move birds around. And it's still a holdover from, this, you know, from the Migratory Bird Act of 1918. Um, Conservation uh, Commission, um, started in the 1900s, and um, basically what their job was, was to bring back some wildlife. And uh, what um, they brought back were non-natives. So at that time, they were looking for species that could survive in the current landscape of 1920. And um, we'll talk about that a little bit. And I just want to mention this, that anybody who studies uh, Iowa wildlife should probably know a little something about Aldo Leopold um, because his eyes, his ideas, about land ethics and wildlife and that predators are needed for a healthy population and that all the pieces of the puzzle are important to have was born out of his experiences in Iowa and basically seeing the decline of Iowa's wildlife. Um, and uh, he did have a book printed after he died called the San County Almanac which really relates to his ethics on lands and and he and San County is in Wisconsin and and uh, he had a, a, a what he called an abused farm that he spent some time bringing back and so there's some interesting things there um, so the commission is supposed to bring something back and so what do they try to bring back is a ring neck pheasant um, I think it's interesting from a bird standpoint that um, the ring neck pheasant is a mix of species it doesn't really exist anywhere all all species of pheasants are Asian um, but um, our ring neck is a special one, and uh, the one in, in the U.S., and um, it's considered uh, some mixture between the black neck and the Chinese subspecies of pheasants. So the state was, the way they did it is, um, at first, was they would gather eggs, and they would distribute them to farmers. And the farmer was supposed to hatch the eggs, which back then it was under chickens or with the oil heated incubator, raise them up and release them on their farms. And actually there was a whole system where each county got so many eggs and they divided them up and, um, you know, they were pretty successful at that. Um, eventually they went to, when there was starting to be a population, they went to just moving birds around. But in the beginning, when there wasn't birds to move around, they actually moved eggs around um, for people to hatch. Um, another non-native bird that was introduced to the state about the same time as the Hungarian partridge. Um, and there's, still some, there's still some in the state, um, uh, but the native bobwhite quail has sort of been on a population decline uh, ever since the introduction of bob wire fences because there was actually a boom in, in, in bob white uh, populations when farmers first came in order to separate grain fields from livestock fields, they would plant uh, hedges and they would let it be a living fence. And uh, that uh, was actually helpful to the bobwhite quail. It was also helpful to cottontails and other wildlife species. But uh, once you could put up a, a bob wire fence and maintain your animals, why, um, you know, that part of Iowa's landscape has been gone. Um, the white-tailed deer, it's hard to believe when you think about all the white-tailed deer now and that they're in the city and all that, but at one point there was considered not a single deer in the state that it was extirpated. The other interesting thing about deer is that the deer that we have in Iowa today is not the same sub subspecies that would have been here uh, pre-settlement because the deer that were brought in to repopulate Iowa and release in Iowa were from a different, different subspecies of deer. Um, and also even today, like what the population can stand, um, half the deer in the state are killed every year. And the population has been more or less stable since about 1990, and that's sort of a goal of the Iowa DNR, to maintain that population. Now the thing is, when you look at the whole state, there are some areas where there is more deer than what people want, and um, you know, there's some you know, human-wildlife conflicts there. The turkey, 
again, it was extirpated from the state, and the first attempts at restocking were, again, different subspecies of turkeys, what we call now the Rio Grande and the Miriams. They're from different parts of the country, um, and they were unsuccessful. Um, but in the 1960s is when they started to bring the turkey back, and, um, and then after the bird became, uh, started to get established, they had most success by moving wild birds. The hatching in captivity and releasing was n never seen to be very successful because really the birds don't really know how to live in the wild with all the hazards. Um, anyways, the, the expansion of that species there at the bottom exceeded the biology expectations and really, they started in 1960. By 1974, they thought there was a stable enough population to support some hunting. The Canada goose, the giant Canada goose, you can kind of see the, the bigger one there with the white spot on its forehead. Some of the giant Canada of that subspecies have that. Um, and it was actually a resident, a non-migratory subspecies of Canada goose, or species of Canada goose, I'm not sure which at this point. I think subspecies. Um, and it was a resident in Iowa and all them wetlands. And actually, the pioneers would, you know, what most waterfowl go through um, a catastrophic molt where they're flightless for the summer. So if you're um, ambitious enough, you can round them up. And that's kind of what people would do um, and, and collect down from them. Um, and uh, so that's through wetland draining and commercial hunting activities why, um, the, the giant Canada goose was extirpated from Iowa too. And so it had to be brought back. And, and just um, for Canada geese in Iowa, we see them flying all around. Those that are flying around now are those, they're the, the giant Canada subspecies. But we do have two other that migrate through. Um, the interior, which is almost as big, and then the little cackling one. So if you've ever seen them up in the sky, you might see the little ones that kind of tag along with the big ones. There's never that many, but uh, you, can look for, uh, you can look for those. Um, probably those who have been around the zoo are familiar with the, the trumpeter swan. It's kind of interesting there. Um, the last wild nesting in 1883, and I know um, some of you that have been here longer know Ron. Before he retired, he was the one who really um, kicked that program off, and I really think it was his idea to do it. And he was a, a wetlands biologist, and his idea was, again, if people can, you know, appreciate the swan and they'll manage their land um, that benefits swans, uh, it will benefit um, lots of wildlife. And actually that is a wild picture there and OH5 is a bird hatched at the Blank Park Zoo and uh, over the years we've probably provided about 25 birds um, towards the the reintroduction program. Currently there's 40 nesting pairs across the state. When they started out their plan was to establish those 15 pairs so you can see that um, they've reached that. Um, the otter extirpated by 1900 um, and uh, restocked starting in 1985 and you can see 345 otters released and um, now they're in all 99 counties. Um, another uh, introduction, you know, a purposeful introduction one is a peregrine falcon and the, you know there was a lot of local coverage of that because uh, you know here in downtown Des Moines the, the way they u introduced it was the you know domestic pigeon supply of food in the city uh, the ledges of city buildings work as perches for peregrines so they really started out um, the reintroduction of the peregrine using cities and uh, you can see in 2011 there were 16 pairs 22 young produced in the state of Iowa. Pri prior to big buildings to nest on, peregrines would nest on uh, cliff faces. So never really that populous in the state, probably more along, along the rivers. Uh, the osprey, we're curr they're currently hacking out some birds. And actually, this is a bird, they're not really sure of its status pre-settlement, but all the impoundments of water and the availability of fish are making Iowa a better place for osprey, which uh, their main diet is uh, catching fish. Um, but anyways, in 2011, 16 um, nests and over 30 uh, osprey naturally hatched. Sandhill crane, there was never a reintroduction program for the, the, the crane, um, the sandhill crane. Um, but um, every year, there gets to be more and more in the state, and uh, the state was kind of surrounded by increasing populations. And um, 
yeah, after, uh, there, after a, a, almost a hundred year absence, the first pair nested at Otter Creek Marsh, which is Tamer County, it's uh, uh, east of here. And uh, since then, they have recorded nesting in the 22 states. But of course, the wildlife spectacle is a little farther west. And you can kind of see by the migra migration pattern there, that red line puts you through about the center of Nebraska. And so um, there's a half a million birds at one time can be a location. And it's uh, whatever, one of the few wildlife spectacles that we can see. Um, this is just a little summary of what uh, the, the bald eagles come back. And um, you can see there, you know, about the same time, about 1900. And, you know, probably at that point, um, not, you know, not really expected to be seen back in the state again. But the, um, there was the Eagle Protection Act, the banning of DDT, and, um, and the Endangered Species Act. And really, I think they oftentimes look at how this bird turned around because the eagle was on the predator list too. It, it, it had, you know, that's how people viewed it. However, there was a mind shift change uh, about what the eagle represents and uh, it was allowed protection and, you know, the Eagle Act kind of shows that. And some people say that the eagle is coming back not because of any, not because of the DDD ban or whatever, it's because of people's attitude change towards the bird. However, even today, well, 250 nests in the state, but um, it's kind of interesting. They are, when it comes to nesting, they're limited by the large cottonwood trees that are in the state. They need a big tree, so you need these 7,500-plus-year-old uh, cottonwoods. And if an eagle's nesting in it, you can't cut the tree down. But if the eagle's not nesting in, they are still harvested along the river. The, um, they are used for pulpwood and stuff like that. And still... Even though lead shot is banned, it's still out in the environment and um, um, waterfowl that eagles will eat, they still ingest the lead shot. It's not just from people shooting at them, but they actually are ingesting it uh, in their prey. The bobcat, um, of the three um, cats in the state, uh, it was the most abundant. Um, but uh, after 1800, there, there weren't many there. Um, however, the cat on its own, and there was kind of some talk, oh, the DNR is reintroducing it, despite the fact that people don't want them there. But I don't know. Everything I've ever heard, they've never done anything. It's just come back on its own from, from other states. And um, the population kept growing. And we t for Iowa, we'll, you should talk a little bit about biopolitics, which just means that political environment makes a difference on how things work and what that is saying that there were people who didn't think um, bobcats should be harvested like a game animal and so it actually did did defer that allowing that to happen for a year but in the end um, there is a season for them in the southern part of Iowa and um, they are currently in all 99 counties too um, this is a little tidbit here. So when Iowa became a state, they first made laws. There wasn't any mountain lions or bears in the state of Iowa. Nobody thought they'd ever be back. So they didn't even list them on Iowa's mammals. So when it says there they have no legal standing, means that they, they don't. So if one comes in, somebody wants to you know, kill it, there's no consequence. Uh, legally for that. And so these mountain lion sightings we see, there's, n there's nothing that says nobody can't kill it because they have no legal standing. And biopolitics keep it that way, meaning that there are people who think these animals should be protected when mountain lions come, they shouldn't be killed. Um, but at this point in time, I don't know, people are afraid of them, I guess, and so they don't want to allow the state to recognize them as a, as an, as a, as a game animal so that they could put a ban on, on hunting them or whatever. But the, but the cougars, the mountain lions, um, since 1995 confirmed sightings in 20 different counties. So um, it's kind of like the bobcat, increasing populations around the state and they're sort of coming back in on their own. Black bears too. They, at one time they were widespread throughout Iowa. The last one killed there, 1876 in Spirit Lake. But uh, starting in the 1990s, We've been getting reports, and uh, there have been reports and sightings in 15 counties. Um, Gray, Wolf, Gray Wolf said the black bear and the um, cougar don't have legal standing, but the wolf does. And that is because, well, at the same time, 
people making the laws thought coyotes were wolves and they called coyotes brush wolves and wolves and it didn't matter. So they lumped all those together and they just called them wolves. And so at the time they wanted a bounty on the wolves, but that gave them legal standing because they were listed as, a, as an animal to be managed. And so if and when wolves come back in the state, they actually do have, have legal standing and in theory uh, would be um, protected. Um, no modern sightings in Iowa, but there are populations in surrounding states, and so, uh, you know, some people think it's just a matter of time before they come. It's also interesting to note that Iowa had two species of wolves, the, the plains wolf and the timber wolf, and how we kind of said the east part of the state was forest and the west was grassland. That's kind of how they were divided, too. Um, so the manage for diversity really comes um, about from Aldo Leopold about when if you're instead of like managing for game animals you manage for diversity of all these things and so that's how you know you need the otters and the waterfowl and the sandhill cranes all that is part of the system and so if um, if we have um, an Iowa DNR and well I want to make this point too the Iowa DNR 98 percent of Iowa is in private ownership so wildlife management in Iowa means managing people because 98 percent of the land is controlled by an individual's thoughts and wants and um, the idea of manage for diversity is is um, you know I think a modern way to think and hopefully um, whatever biopolitics we're involved with, I hope that uh, that is an idea that we have. Uh, you, you view wildlife from a community spec perspective and not from you know, a, a game and a hunting perspective. Um, loss of habitat remains to be the single greatest threat to Iowa's wildlife, urban sprawl, intensive farming, and industrial development. Um, so the challenge for us, as, all, as we are all Iowans, and the wildlife is owned by us, um, creating a viable and socially acceptable wildlife environments within a landscape dominated by agriculture. And I'm sure that uh, you know, it's going to be dominated by agriculture for a long time to come. Um, but if you haven't seen it, the Iowa DNR has come up with the Iowa Wildlife Action Plan, where they go over species by species and what their plans are. And I just kind of went over some of the bigger species, but there's a whole lot. Jackrabbits, spotted skunks, striped skunks, everyone has a story uh, about what their population trends have done. So. Really, that's my story, and uh, hopefully um, some of those things uh, were interesting to you, and uh, thank you. Yeah.